Thank you very much for the invitation. It's really nice to be back in Princeton, except for the allergy. So if I sneeze, please excuse me. Um, so today I would like to uh, talk about standard conjecture of Kunet type with torsion coefficients. So this was in res this is an answer in response to an telling you what the question was. Let me try to remind you of two kind of standard conjectures on algebraic cycles. So let me start with the Hodge conjecture. So let's say um, so throughout today, x is going to be a projective smooth variety. Uh, variety of dimension n. Often over the complex numbers. So let's say over the complex numbers. Then we can talk. We can consider uh, the free abelian group of co-dimension C cycles on X. So these are former integral linear combinations of the classes of co-dimension C subvarieties. Co-dimension C. Then we have a map, the cycle class map from GC of X to H2C of x with q coefficients by looking at this as a homology class of codimension 2C, real codimension 2C. Uh, and then if you map it to the drum cohomology, then you can use the Hodge composition Hij, so harmonic forms of type Ij. And Hodge theory tells us that the image of the cycles are going to land in Hcc. So if you look at the kind of the pullback diagram, uh, we have Cartesian diagram. So this map is going to fetch us through this. And the conjecture of Hodge is that the image of this arrow HCC XQ. Expand the target um, right so if you want to test the Hodge conjecture you have to start with some class in this group and try to express it as a linear combination of algebraic cycles so one such Examples are given by the so-called Kunet projectors. So let me recall what the standard conjecture of Kunet type is of Kunet type. And this is due to growth and dick. So Starting from this projective smooth variety of dimension n, we can consider x cross x, so it has dimension 2n, and so it depends on two things. First of all, if you have a cohomology class of degree 2n on this self-product, 
with, let's say, Q coefficients, then it acts on the cohomology of x itself, acts on h x q. Uh, and the way the action is constructed is, so you start from the total cohomology. Pull it back via the first projection. X cross X with Q coefficients. And then now we are on X cross X. I can use the cup product. So that lands in H2 star plus 2N X cross X. And then push it forward using the second projection. <coughs> then this becomes a linear map that de preserves the degrees. Let me briefly note that in the construction of this Giesin map, we use the Poincaré duality. So cohomology pulls back, homology pushes forward. So if you want to push forward a cohomology class, use duality. So now, so this is first fact. And secondly, so we have so-called QNF projectors. Idempotence. So let me call it pi i x with q coefficients. So there are elements in uh, this group. whose effect on the cohomology is, right, so you start with the total cohomology. So it is the direct sum of hi's as i ranges over 0 through 2n. So you project it onto one of the factors. Let's call it hi of x. And then you can put it, put it back into the total cohomology, like this. And the conjecture of Grothendieck is that this one is algebraic. So it is in the span of the image of the cycle class map. Uh, this just one word about the status. So it's known for varieties whose such that whose I mean all of whose cohomology classes are algebraic, obviously. <laughs> so flag varieties. So we're going to put Grassmannians and so on. And by what's known as Lieberman's trick, it's known for abelian varieties. And using that, you can also prove the Kunev conjecture in dimension and most two. And there is an obvious analog in a tar cohomology for varieties of our arbitrary field. So Katz and Messing proved the analog of this conjecture for a tar cohomology and crystalline cohomology, so true of uh, finite fields. But other than these cases, it is wide open.
Right, now that I have recorded these two well-known conjectures, let me give you what Akshay asked me. So, right, so the basic question is, you replace Q with FP. So if you have a cohomology class with FP coefficients, then it acts on the FP cohomology algebra. So you start with FP cohomology, pull it back, copy it, and push it forward. So the only thing that needs to be noted is that here we are using Poincaré duality, which is fine with FP coefficients. So everything works. And we still have mod P QNET projectors whose effect is as before, except that I'm using FP everywhere. Right. So the question of Akshay. was that can these things be algebraic? So what is Jan Jan huh? What is his name? <laughs> oh, right. Ankat Pesh. Right. No, no. Does the question make sense of Z already? It does make sense if the, I mean, I'm going to come back to this. If it, it, it makes sense if either the cohomology is torsion free or if you kill the torsion. Right. So let me try to tell you why I got interested in this question, and then why I think he was interested. And I mean, by reminding ourselves two classic examples of these algebraic, I mean, torsion algebraic cycles. So I'm going to remind you two classical examples of uh, such consideration. So first of all, let's go back to the Hodge conjecture. So of course, this class map not just lands in here. It lands in the integral cohomology. And this map is not injection in general. So if you make another pullback diagram, you can consider HCC with C coefficients. So the map factors through this one. Then you can ask the question, sort of so-called integral Hodge conjecture. Hodge conjecture that this image on the integral level, so is that this map is should be surjective. I mean it's a question. H C C that's C. So that gives me one reason why I was interested in this question. Um, so this, is, this question, integral Hodge conjecture, or maybe I should say when it's true. So this is true, 
for c equals 0 or 1. For divisors, it's true. But it is false already in C equals 2. And the first such examples were given by Atia and Hirzebruch. So what they did was they constructed, so they gave the answer. And the answer is no in general. So constructed examples of x. Um, well, let me just, let me even say, so for Godot-Sayer surfaces, Godot-Sayer varieties, These are, roughly speaking, you start with a complete intersection in some projective space and divide it by a finite group action. That's how you get these godot varieties. X, such that um, there is a non-zero cohomology class in H4 of x with z coefficient. And it is also torsion, let's say p torsion. So for every prime p, this construction works. Dimension of x is, it's somewhat bigger than p. So I, if I remember correctly, it should be around 2p or something. Later, right. So another question was after this work was, can you cut down the dimension how and how far? Uh, Claire Voisin gave a, an example where the dimension can be uniformly just 5. Right, there is such a torsion cohomology class such that there is not annihilated by certain Art dimensional synod operation. You look at its image in H4 of X with F3 coefficients and look at look how the synod operations act. You can construct such an example that the result is non zero. However, Um, the image of this cycle class map C, in this case C2 of X is contained in the kernel of these things. So in order to prove that they use a certain K-theory and later this was somewhat clarified and expanded by Bert Totaro, um, who gave another proof of this fact using complex cobordisms. So this is kind of one algebraic topological reason why um, the behavior of torsion cohomology classes being algebraic is somewhat interesting. Now the second reason comes from geometry. Right. And it comes from birational classification of varieties. So let me be slightly more general and allow myself to have an algebraically closed field. And let me make two definitions in algebraic geometry. So a projective smooth variety, let me just say variety, 
x over k is rational if its function field is purely transcendental. So this function field is isomorphic to k t1 through tn. In other words, there, are, there is a rational map between x and p to the n that is that establishes an isomorphism on, on open dense subsets. And there is a related notion called unirationality, where I think x over k is unirational if if um, the function field of x embeds into such a tr purely transcendental extension. In other words, it admits a map, it, it admits a dominant rational map from p to the n. So because I'm assuming that k is infinite, the two definitions are e equivalent. So if, if k is finite, I mean, the two will a priori be different. So a classical question of Rirot is, so of course, if you have a rational variety, it's going to be unirational. So the question is, is the converse true? And the answer to the real of question turns out to be somewhat interesting. So it is true in dimension one. So what it means is that if your curve is dominated by p1, then your curve has to be p1. So it is still true in dimension 2 if the characteristic of k is 0. But this is a much deeper fact. And this is due to so-called Castelnuovo criterion. And the answer turns out to be no in dimension 2 in positive characteristic. So there are unirational but irrational surfaces in positive characteristic. Not top of my head. Right. So you can make two two definitions: n to be dimension of x, or you can allow larger larger n. The two definition will be the same if k is infinite, essentially because you can use. I mean, you can start from some p to the m, where with large m, and cut it by a suitable hyper plane repeatedly, which is possible as long as you can use Bertini theorem, I mean Bertini kind of theorem. So whether these two definitions coincide with a finite field, I do not know. I mean, I haven't looked. Right. So. Now the question is, what happens in dimension 3? So I haven't done the homework about history. But as far as I know, the first example in dimension 3 of a unirational variety that is irrational over complex numbers 
was constructed by Clemens and Griffith. So now, in dimension three, even over complex numbers, uh, this is due to Clemens and Griffith. And more specifically, they construct, they show that by using the intermediate Jacobians, they show that a very general cubic threefold is unirational. But, right, I mean, they show that there are such things. I mean, cub among, among general cubic threefolds, there are unirational varieties that are not rational. I mean, of course, you can ask this Rirov question if you want, you know, kind of in terms of algebraic cycles by looking at x cross pn, and you ask whether there is an algebraic cycle of the middle dimension uh, giving these things. So this is also sort of kind of implicitly related to the question of algebraic cycles. Right. So first, such construction was done by Clemens and Griffith. But soon afterwards, I mean, as far as I can check the literature, within one year, uh, Artin and Mumford gave different construction. And their, I mean, one advantage of their construction was that it was much more elementary in the following sense. So Artin and Mumford in the early 70s um, constructed unirational threefold unirational threefolds x such that if you look at the third cohomology with integral coefficients then it has non-trivial torsion in it. Now, if you have a rational threefold, uh, by Hironaka's theorem, it can be linked by blowing up and down to P3. And P3 has no torsion in cohomology. And in blowing up a point or a curve, you do not create any torsion or destroy it. So, so note, if x is a rational threefold, then the whole cohomology is torsion free. So in particular, Martin and Mumford examples give you unirational but irrational threefolds. So these were the two reasons I got interested in the question. Yes. Atia Hirzebrook and Artin Mumford. On the other hand, here's what I believe Here's why I believe Akshay was interested in this question. And that's somewhat different from motivations. So he's very much interested in torsion automorphic forms. And in particular, torsion cohomology classes in Schumer varieties, so on. So, so here's the third reason. Um, he raised the question when I was reporting my work with Sophie Morel at Stanford. And the theorem that I reported, restrict, I mean, restrict, restrict our expectation in this sense.
Right. So, right, let me ask a question. Is the mod p sign conjecture could it be true uh, for Shimura varieties, for compact Shimura varieties? Okay, let me, before stating my theorem that answers this question, let me make one bit of definition. So, uh, right, before. They come from Hecke correspondences. Yeah, they do. So, I mean, when we took up this kind of project, what we were kind of inspired by was work of Katz and Messing, where o over finite fields, you always have Frobenius correspondence. So what they proved was, well, these are enough to separate the cohomology degrees by using the Lin's phase conjectures. So what we did was, OK, so in, for general varieties, we don't have that many finite correspondences. But for Shimura varieties, we do. So that was the idea. And it turned out to work to, to this extent. A sign conjecture is enough. Right, so I'm going to answer that question. Uh, but before that, let me make one final bit of definition. So if you give me a variety, projective smooth variety x, and a prime number p, then I'm going to define i p of x. That's the initial incidence of p torsion. So cohomologically, this is the smallest, the least i, such that if you look at the reduction mod p map, so hi of x with z coefficients goes to h hi of x with f p coefficients. Then you can ask whether this map is onto. So you look at the first incidence where this is not subjective. And equivalently, homologically, so least i such that if you look at the Homology with integer coefficients. So this is hi of x with z. That's hi of x with fp. Yeah. And homologically, uh, you can look at the homology and find the least degree where the homology contains non trivial p torsion. And of course, if the cohomology or homology doesn't contain any p torsion, this number is going to be infinity. So of course, when Akshay asked this question, he was skeptical in general. There should be some counterexample. What was somewhat surprising to me, I mean, after I found out what happens, was that if there is any non-trivial p-torsion, it's false. It's kind of. But let me uh, quantify that statement. So first part is. Suppose that this IP number is finite. IP of x is finite. Then um, I'm going to give you three idempotents. 
So pi i x with fp coefficients and pi 2n minus i x with fp coefficients. So n is, as usual, the dimension of x. And you can add the two. So there are, because they are orthogonal idempotents, their sum is also an idempotent. Uh, then these are not algebraic. So now that I proved this, uh, second thing I proved was so if you give me a number i for any prescribed number i, that's at least one, and if you you can also specify the dimension as long as it's at least i plus one. that exists x over c with a prescribed ip number and the dimension is equal to n. So you can apply part 1 to these examples to show that for every i there is some variety uh, such that pi i of x is not algebraic. And moreover, if i is at least 3, And n is at least 2i minus 1, then uh, we may assume right, there is x over c such that it has the right ip number, right dimension, and x is also rational. In particular, simply connected. Um, so one small note here is that this this bound i being at least three is sharp in the sense that when i equals two, and if you take n equals two times two minus one, three. And there is no such thing. That's, that was essentially the observation of Artin and Mumford. Right, so that. Um, answers well, my own questions, in a sense, because I was interested in these things from topological and geometric viewpoint. To go back to Akshay's question, let me just simply note that there are compact Shimura surfaces with IP being equal to 1. So if you look at this last idempotent, so that we have pi 1 plus pi 3. Now pi 0 and pi 4 are always algebraic, because you can look at the fibers in either direction. So because the odd Kenneth projectors, their sum is not the Mati sign conjecture is also false. 
for, the, for certain sh compact shimmer surfaces. Right. So that was, to an extent, the expected part of the answer. So there is a topological obstruction to the validity of Mod P Kunev conjectures. So naturally, the next natural question is, is there a geometric non-topological obstruction? Although I, I'm, I suppose actually it's not going to be interested in this anymore, but I am. <laughs> what about uh, varieties with torsion free cohomology or homology? So, for example, you can have complete intersections, smooth complete intersections. And also, you have abelian varieties. So I do not know how to answer this question in general. I do not have a single counter example of a variety with torsion free cohomology for which mod p Kunev conjecture is false. But I have some partial result in the sort of affirmative direction. Uh, which was somewhat unexpected because it involves the so-called Schottky problem. So if x is the Jacobian of a curve, then Akshay's question, Venka, Right. Question has affirmative answer. For all prime number P. So as a corollary, um, if X is an abelian variety. Uh, principally polarized abelian variety. Uh, principally polarized abelian variety of dimension at most three. Then we have the affirmative answer. Yes to Akshay's question. because these Jacobians are dense in the moduli. So let me give you a sketch of the proof of this theorem. So this theorem is purely algebraic topology. This one deals with more geometry. Yeah, maybe I can say one word about the proof of the theorem one. Use Bachstein <laughs> instead of Steinrad. OK, so how do I construct um, these Kunev projectors as algebraic cycles? So now let me be slightly more general. 
So let x be a principally polarized abelian variety of dimension g. So let's look at the Chern class of the polarization. So let's call it B. So that's Chern class of the polarization that lives in H2 of x with C coefficients. Then on x cross, so I need to construct some classes on x cross x. So there are three maps I can use. There's first projection, there's multiplication, and second projection. So I can pull back uh, the class of E to x cross x. So let me call EI to be projection I pull back E. So that's in second cohomology of x cross x. This is supposed to be multiplication mu. And so for M, what I'm going to do is I pull back the polarization via summation, the upper star of E, but I'm going to subtract these guys. I'm sorry? Yeah, I guess so, yeah. And the reason I, yeah, for me, the reason I do this is to make, so these guys have respective QNF types. So this is going to be 2, 0, and 0, 2. And this guy has QNF type 1, 1. So by the general invariant theory for symplectic groups, for example, that's in Weil's book on invariant theory, uh, we know that these three things, so pi i of x is going to be a Hodge class. And by invariant theory, we can write this as a linear combination of intersection product of these three things. So let me write gamma A, B, C of E1 raised to the eighth power, M raised to the fifth power, E2 raised to the sixth power. So this happens in cohomology. And of course, you need to have the correct QNF type. So 2A plus B must be equal to 2g minus i, and b plus 2c must be equal to i, because this has that goodness time. So I knew this, and this, um, right, this gamma ibc rational numbers. And, and then I realized that it's really hard to compute these things. Fortunately for me, uh, somebody else did it for me. I mean, it was done way before I was interested in this question. So if you look at 1994 motifs volume, uh, sure. Anthony Shore actually calculated this constant. And that's quite that's quite beautiful. It's minus one to the i, a factorial, b factorial, c factorial. Uh it should be, but Right, it should be related. Yeah. So, right, now, right, now what do I do? 
Uh, so I start from this. So pi i of x is a, b, c minus 1 to the i, e1 to the a, a factorial, m, b, b factorial, e to c over c factorial. So this is true in the rational cohomology. Now, for each n, at least one, uh, maybe, right. So we can look at the higher abel jacobi map. Now I'm going to assume that x is a Jacobian of a curve C. So we have Cn, which is n for product, mod out by the symmetric group action. So alpha n goes to the Jacobian, which is also x. And the celebrated formula of Poincaré tells us that right, I need to have the right dimension. So if I look at alpha g minus n, G is the genus of uh, genus of C. So if you look at the push forward of the fundamental class, and if you multiply G mod n factorial to it, then that's going to give you E n. I'm sorry. So I need to multiply n factorial. Uh, so it has co-dimension, it, it has dimension g minus n, g minus n. So it has co-dimension n, so it has the right co-dimension, right. So thanks to Poincaré's formula, these things are integral. That's the proof. Okay, I'm running out of time, so let's stop here. <laughs>